all, this is Rick Levine with your March 2024 Astrological Forecast. Before we get into the nitty-gritty of the month, and this month is another month that is going to be an important transition, a lot of stuff is going down leading to April where things are going to really pick up again, so we'll get into all of that in just a moment. Before I get into that, I would just like to, first of all, um, let you all know or to remind you that I'm working on some special offers that are going to be available only to those people on my email list. So if you're not a subscriber to my email list, go to Rick Levine Astrologer, all one word, Rick Levine Astrologer, www.ricklevineastrologer.com. Sign up now and get on that list, even if you're already um, getting notifications for the YouTube monthlies. Um, there'll be other things coming through that list, and so go ahead and do that. That's number one. Number two, uh, Astrology Night is Friday night, March 1st. Some of you will probably not watch this until after that event. Uh, it's okay because it will be on my YouTube channel. It will be live streamed for those of you who are not in the Seattle area. And I will be covering things that are different from the forecast that I'm going to be doing now um, or in a few minutes, which will be the day-by-day -day forecast of the major astrological events for the month. When I do the uh, live event at Astrology Night, at Soul Food uh, Coffee House in Redmond, Washington. We take a bit of a different look, and so there'll be some different material there. So that's 6.30 p.m. Friday night, first Friday of every month, March 1st. Uh, the following one will be on the eve of my birthday, which will be April 5th, Friday night, April 5th. My birthday is April 6th. I'm having an eclipse for my birthday celebration. We'll get there uh, in, a, in a little bit. Um, okay, a, a couple of other things I want to announce, just things that are coming up. Um, I will be teaching a course uh, at Kepler College. Many of you know that I was a founding trustee um, of the Kepler College. And I'll be teaching a course there beginning on April 14th, uh, April 14th through May 19th. There'll be five sessions. There'll be information available on that in the uh, next uh, week or so on that site. It's not there um, yet. Uh, however, the course will be on applying the magic of harmonic aspects, one of my favorite topics these days, and it's one that I keep coming back to. In fact, I will also uh, be teaching at the Tucson Astrologers Guild on May 10th and 11th. So any of you living in the Tucson area, um, you can contact the TucsonAstrologyGuild.org for more information on that. I'll be doing a Friday evening lecture on uh, astrology in the 21st century. And then on Saturday, I will be talking uh, doing an in-depth dive into the art of astrological consultation, talking about taking your individual consultations and chart readings to the next level. I will also be doing something in Sedona. We haven't finalized arrangements on that, so pay attention to the website. And again, if you're on my mailing list, you'll get a notification uh, for that. But I'll be talking about that um, at next month's forecast and have more information on what's up in Sedona. It'll be right around that same weekend of May 10th and 11th. Uh, it'll be on that same trip. Next, I want to mention the 40th annual NORWAC. I can't believe it's the 40th. It's only my 34th NORWAC that I've attended, so I've missed a few along the line. Um, but it's important to just make a mental note that the physical in real life NORWAC is sold out. So if you haven't already registered and signed up, you won't be able to attend. However, no one does virtual conferences like NORWAC. They really have it down. And if you're interested in attending, you can still come to the conference online. It's a tremendous deal. Uh, um, all the speakers will not only be available to you, but they'll be doing, they'll be present 
present in uh, chat rooms so that you'll be able to engage your favorite speakers. Um, and you can find more about that at norwac.net. Um, all the links, incidentally, to the events that I'll be talking about uh, right now uh, will be in the comments, in the first pinned comment uh, on the YouTube. And so you'll have access to those those links. Um, at Norwac, I'll be doing two lectures. Um, one, a kind of introductory lecture on uh, making the signs come alive uh, by the planets. And then I'll be doing another lecture uh, about overcoming patriarchal biases in astrology in general and in natal chart work. And then I'll be doing a post-conference session. Even if you're not attending the conference itself, you can register for this as a separate event. That'll be on Monday, May 27th. Norwalk is on Memorial Day weekend. And uh, and that'll be a hands-on chart interpretation workshop. Uh, the title is Getting to the Core of the Matter in Real Time. And uh, that'll be a fun and engaging and something that you'll be able to learn about uh, chart interpretation, whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or even a practicing professional. The following uh, event that I'll be doing will be the weekend of June 7th, 8th, and 9th. And this is going to be in Rhinebeck, New York. It's a couple of hours, about an hour and a half north of New York City in the beautiful Hudson River Valley. And this is going to be at Omega Institute, which is a magnificent place for um, events. It's a great place to either to teach and or to learn. Um, this event will be entitled Humanity Rising in the Leo Aquarius Age. Now, we normally think of the age of Aquarius, even though it may still be a century down the road. We're getting early warnings and glimpses of it with uh, Pluto moving now in, in Aquarius. But we will um, be uh, talking about this larger shift of this Leo Aquarius axis because all signs in astrology really are axes. They're, um, they have two sides to the equation. And, um, and I will be joined by Maurice Fernandez, uh, Lynn Bell, who's coming over from Paris, an American astrologer who's been living in Paris for years, for decades, um, Amir Bey, a, um, uh, a performance astrologer, and uh, excited about seeing what he's got up his sleeve, um, Valerie Weir uh, will be there, and maybe most importantly, will be joined by Linda Tucker, who is the um, uh, South African keeper of the white sac the sacred white lion tradition, and there's a whole story here. She has books out on this, um, and this is going to be really not only about astrology ceremony, but also about creation uh, and the uh, engagement of the star lions or the return of the white lions. This is going to be a very exciting weekend, the weekend of June 7th through 9th, and I would suggest uh, checking that out, and the link also will be um, in the comment section and down below here. The following weekend after that, on June 15th, I'm going to be back up at the Boston NCGR um, meeting. Uh, the NCGR chapter meets in Belmont, just outside of Boston. And this is going to be a Saturday afternoon on June 15th. And it's going to be a deep dive into the astrology of relationships. I'll see many of you there. Uh, just as a point of interest, I'm going to be doing uh, the guide work for the uh, Astrology Hub Inner Circle, and that's going to be in the month of September. And also, I will be at the UKAA, the Astrology Association of, uh, UK, of the UK, um, the weekend of August 28th through September 1st. I'll be doing a pre-conference workshop there and a lecture at that conference, and that's going to be um, up near um, um, uh, Coventry uh, at a conference center. You can find more information about that at the AA site, and that link also will be down below. Uh, the last two things I want to mention just briefly is that I will also be one of the teachers 
for a deep dive at the OPA. OPA is the OPA, the Organization for Professional Astrology, and their annual conference is going to be in Park City, Utah, and that's going to be October 16th through the 21st. And again, I'm going to be focusing on the um, on, on the art and the practice and the craft of uh, taking chart readings to the next level. This is going to be an in-depth dive with me for, at this conference. You actually pick one faculty member, and although there are group events, you really work very deeply with that person over the course of the days of the conference. There'll be more information available on that over the days and weeks ahead at the OPA um, uh, website. And I will see many of you there. OPA conferences are very different than other conferences. They're really hands-on working conferences, and they're educationally oriented, and uh, they're also a lot of fun. The group is a great group. I've been involved with OPA since its inception as an organization. And then lastly, a quick reminder that I will be back in Goa, India, uh, November 23rd through December 4th. is a little bit earlier than, than I did last year. Um, but like last year, I do expect this to sell out. We're limiting this to 35 people. Um, and so if this is, sounds intriguing to you, check this out at Heaven and Earth Workshops. Um, again, the link is below, and a clickable link will be in the comments below. Um, because uh, this event is limited and will sell out, if it is something that you're thinking about, it's a good idea to register early. And of course, because it's in India, it may take some advanced thinking and planning. Um, it's a two-week uh, retreat, and it is a deep dive into all aspects and practice of, uh, practices of astrology, um, both lecture and intellectual work and some deeper experiential work. Um, it's a lot of fun, and I'm looking forward to this again. I love teaching at this place. It's a an, an Ayurvedic healing spa, just a short walk down to a gorgeous, beautiful, swimmable beach on the Arabian Sea in the south end of Goa, India. Um, enough on that now, um, and I want to get to uh, the month ahead to March. And um, But I also like to take this opportunity to bring you up to date on some of the things that I'm doing, because I know that some of you are very interested in that. And by the way, I would just like to give a shout out to how many of you attended the Conscious Life Expo down in Los Angeles last month. I have spoken about that before here. And if you live in the LA area, put it on your calendar for next year. I mean, over well over 10,000 people attended this event. Many of um, you who uh, came to that event and attended my uh, keynote speak and the panels that I was on and the post-conference workshop, um, it was just a great event. It was really lovely to meet so many of you. And to actually get to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with many of you. It was, it was quite fun, quite exciting, and it's such an amazing group of people, and the information that comes in on that weekend, is it's a bit overwhelming because, as I know, many of you know, astrology is simply one facet on the crystal of this new age or new um, expanded awareness that that involves many different pieces, including the understanding of who we are, not only on planet Earth, but in the cosmos itself, not only from an astrological perspective, um, but of course, from the perspective of, of um, ET and disclosure and AI and, um, and, and uh, healing and, and medical sovereignty and, and all kinds of other issues that have to do with rediscovering uh, the past and and really kind of getting positioned for what's happening right now as humanity is going through this incredible um, contraction as it goes through the birth canal to whatever it is that we're going to be on the other side of these decades in front of us. So that's it. Let's take a look at March and see what we got cooking. Um, I know that uh, when, we're, when we're looking at March, a lot of people are very aware that March... Um, in, in some ways has a few very particular events, but 
on a deeper level, February and March are really transitions to what's coming up in April and May and June. We're on the launch pad now. There's no going back. Uh, time is speeded up, even though we may have thought that things were moving fast. I've said many times before that going back to the Saturn-Pluto conjunction in January of 2020, and, and that and that cluster of planets moving through Capricorn, not only Saturn and Pluto, but even Jupiter and the nodal axis. And and that period of January, February, March of 2020, and the feeling like we were stuck in that period of so long. And then this conflict of what's going on and what did that mean and where are we and how are we moving out of that into what's next. And then the idea that I've been talking about now for, geez, about a year, because it was about a year ago, actually, um, in March of 2023, that Pluto tipped into Aquarius in, in the beginning of March, and then back into Capricorn in May, where it stayed for the rest of the year, as if we were getting more time to tie up loose ends back in all of that older stuff that was going on. And then Pluto in January of this year, 2024, moved back into Aquarius, where it's going to be for most of the year. It's going to just tip back into into Capricorn for a couple of months, um, right around September, October, November, and then we'll move back into Aquarius, where it's going to be for the next couple of decades. We are getting waves of a sense of what's coming around the bend. And maybe we're already getting, in some ways, we're slightly around the bend, but the tide's washing us back and forth, and we're not really free to be moving in this new direction yet, although it may feel like it. We're getting swept up in some very large, dynamic, cosmic tides. And all I can say is that we ain't seen nothing yet. The amount of, of, of transition and change, both from a cosmological perspective, from a sense of uh, knowing who we are and where we are and where we're going, from a global political um, evolutionary sense, uh, from an economic sense, um, is it, just going to be so much going on over the next few years. As pretty much all the outer planets change signs, Pluto is still kind of cuspal moving although it's more solidly in um, in Aquarius now, um, even Pluto is going to go, uh, it, it turns retrograde in May, um, and then we'll back up into Capricorn again before it moves into Aquarius for real. But at the same time, uh, we also have um, um, other planets that are getting ready to transition and change signs. Um, obviously, <clears throat> Uh, Jupiter, which changes signs every year, is going to be moving into Gemini this year still. And although it's not in March, it does that in May, and we're really kind of getting close to that. And that's going to be a very important bellwether of what's coming up, because although Jupiter right now is in focus because by April 20th, Jupiter moving through Taurus is going to catch up to Uranus in Taurus. Then by May, Jupiter will move out of Taurus and into Gemini. But the important thing to understand is that by 2025, um, in summer of 2025, so really just a year down the road, um, Uranus is going to move out out of Taurus into Gemini, it'll be cuspal for a year moving back into Taurus and then back into Gemini. But with Jupiter moving into Gemini, we're going to get kind of a, um, uh, almost like a harbinger of what's to come when Uranus moves into Gemini, because then things are really going to be changing and changing fast. In fact, Neptune is also changing signs, and Neptune is going to be moving out of Pisces, where it's been, um, and it will move, having spent 14 years in Pisces, Neptune is going to move into um, Aries one year from now, next March. And, and even though it'll be cuspal for about a year, it will move into Aries in March, dr drift back into Pisces, um, and then move into Aries for the next 14 years, um, early 2026. So, all of this is to say that 
what we're going through now is we're getting waves and tastes of what's happening because even this month as planets are moving through Pisces and we're going to talk about that more in just a moment when we when we start looking at 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 the uh, chart of uh, uh, March 1st because the transition of a lot of the planets right now uh, the sun and mercury over the oh, through March from Pisces into Aries, in some ways, is going to be a, mm, again, a harbinger of the movement of Saturn from Pisces into Aries and Neptune from Pisces into Aries that are going to be much deeper and more powerful transitions. So, we have an exciting period of time coming up, uh, and let's shift gears and actually look at the chart for March 1st for the record. I am recording this on the evening of, uh, the, the, 20 of, of the 29th on Leap Day. Actually, it's Leap Evening already, um, and I am recording this with the moon in Scorpio, and this last day or so of the month of February, as the moon is moving through Scorpio, we're getting some trines from the moon in Scorpio as it's picking up uh, trines to Saturn and the Sun um, and to um, Mercury, all in Scor all in Pisces, and then later to Neptune. And and I should say that as we look at this chart for um, noon on March first we can see this cluster of planets uh, from Saturn at 9 degrees of Pisces, almost 10 degrees actually, the Sun at 11 degrees, and Mercury at 12, now almost 13 degrees. And it's important to understand that over the 28th and 29th, we had this triple Kazemi or double Kazemi, triple conjunction of, <clears throat> excuse me, of Mercury and the Sun, and Mercury and Saturn, and the Sun and Saturn, all lining up in Pisces. And there is a bit of a heaviness to this energy. There's a sense of a reality check. Um, a number of things have gone down globally, politically, um, uh, uh, Supreme Court decision, some other court decisions in the United States that impact the political situation, um, some things in Gaza, which are, again is beyond catastrophe, horrific, um, but the, all of these events, and, and because I'm not do, doing a deep dive on these events in particular, I'm, I, I don't want to just pass over them because it's really important what's going on right now, and it's important that as we talk globally and cosmically and we talk about these big picture things that we don't lose sight of how these planetary aspects are focusing our energy, there are larger transitions and shifts that we are going through. And these events right now seem very difficult. They seem very complicated because it might feel like we're ineffectual and there's nothing that we can do as individuals. But that is exactly what the power structure wants to uh, have us believe. And it's really important that we stay focused and aware of what's going on. Astrology is a a magnificent tool to expand our awareness, but we also have to expand our awareness on a local scene, not just a cosmic scene, so that we can be aware of what's going on, so that we can manifest the reality that we want to come out of this, even though it might appear from a karmic standpoint that we're, that we're still, uh, it's like, it's like the, um, uh, dog is wagging the tail, but in fact, we are the tail right now, and ultimately, we will be wagging the dog. And so, it's important to understand things in the longer cycle and not become discouraged and therefore go silent. So, that's enough of what I'm going to say about that right now. But the Mercury conjunction to the Sun and Saturn certainly has been a reality check, and, and it's important for us to pay attention to where those restrictions, constrictions, limitations, where the power of the authority has been appeared to be wielded. And, and yet we have to keep in mind that this is all in Pisces. Saturn in Pisces is you don't see what you get, you don't get what you see. Normally, Saturn is the giver of reality. Saturn is the ultimate authority. But in Pisces, 
it's it's a bit muddled because in Pisces, the water, underwater, the fish don't see in a straight line. We're not seeing things out there. We're, we're seeing through the, the murkiness and the haze of the water. Um, things are not, light doesn't travel in a straight line. It zigs and it zags. And so it's really important not to be confused um, by, by, by mistaking what we see for what is true. And so uh, it's important that even though we have this lineup of Mercury and the Sun in, and, and Saturn, that this is in a way the beginning of the flavor of, of uh, March, it's also important to understand that the energies are moving from Pisces into Aries, and as they do, this marks a new beginning that happens every year at the vernal equinox as the planets, as the Sun ingresses um, on the vernal equinox. Um, from Pisces into Aries, and um, and and that occurs um, this year. Um, although it normally occurs within a day or two of the um, 18th, 19th, or 20th, this year the um, the vernal equinox is at 8:06 p.m. on March 19th. And of course, as always, all times that I give are Pacific uh, time. We have to make a mental note for those of you who are not in the United States, though, that United States um, practices daylight saving time, and that we that our clocks change. Uh, at 2 a.m. on March 10th, on Sunday morning, March 10th. And so that all times that I'm giving up until um, of, and through March 9th, up, and th- up through 2 a.m. on March 10th, all these times will be Pacific Standard Time. But once we go to um, March 10th, 11th, and onward, they're going to be Pacific Daylight Time, which means our clocks are going to be a, a, um, an hour greater. And so for those of you, for example, who are using Greenwich Mean Time or are on, um, on uh, European or Australian time, you need to make sure that you account for that additional hour of difference uh, because my clock here is going to be Daylight Time, which is one hour ahead of what it normally is compared to your time locally. All right, enough on that. So um, let's look here at the chart for March 1st. And again, as I already mentioned, we can see the alignment of Saturn, the Sun, and Mercury. We can see that the Moon moving through Scorpio um, is kind of already um, by midday, and all my charts are going to be for noon, unless I note otherwise for the full Moon and and new Moon. And and of course, we have the full Moon that will be an eclipse, the first of two eclipses. March is bringing us to the um, entry of eclipse season. We'll have more to say about that in a moment. Um, but um, uh, we can see here that at noon that the moon is already through the trines um, uh, to Saturn, the sun, and Mercury, and then yet it's coming into um, the trine to, to Neptune. The other thing on March 1st is that the sun makes a sextile with Jupiter, and this is a bit of optimism. This is a bit of hope. There's a sense here that that something is happening that we may feel some inklings of whatever the restrictions of all that heavy Mercury, Sun, Saturn energy was, we're feeling the potential of maybe what's around the corner. Um, And on top of that, we also have um, Venus forming a sextile with Chiron. Both of these are in the morning on the first. But this again is the potential for healing and being attracted toward doing those things that that actually have some healing energy associated with them. As we move to the second, um, we can see though that we also have Mercury um, uh, on the second making a half square with with Pluto. And this Mercury half square to, to Pluto uh, uh, is, is important because we notice that, um, that Pluto is one of the culprits here that we've had 
problems with going all the way back to October when we had the um, Mars square Pluto on October 7th, 8th, and the beginning of the um, catastrophe that is occurring um, in uh, the Mideast right now, the, the, uh, the uh, disruption and genocide that's occurring in um, Gaza. And, um, and so I, we can expect that as um, Mercury makes the half square with Pluto on the evening of March 2nd, that we can see more uh, disruption around that, as if that has stopped at all. It certainly hasn't, whether it's being covered or not in, in the media, whatever media it is that you may choose to observe. The other thing, though, that is happening that is very important is that on the 2nd, um, the moon actually moves into Sagittarius. And this occurs at about 6 a.m. Pacific time, actually 5.56 a.m. exactly, so that by midday we can see that the moon is already in Sagittarius. And again, this is magnifying our hope, magnifying the potential of, um, of what, we, what, what we can see around the corner. But as the moon moves through Sagittarius on the 2nd and 3rd, what was trines uh, just a day or two ago, the moon is going to be making squares to Saturn and the sun and Mercury and, um, and, and Neptune as it moves through Sagittarius. The other thing, though, that is happening now as the moon is moving through Sagittarius on the 2nd is that by the 3rd, we can see that Venus is making a square with Uranus. And that Venus square to Uranus is, again, it's, it's something abrupt. It's something that breaks through. There's a sense of the lightning striking, of seeing the clarity. And even if it's not what we're supposed to think or not what we're supposed to like or not what we're supposed to be attracted to, we're, we're getting glimpses of, of something that, that is hopeful and something that is around the bend. Something's beginning to break loose. And on top of that, we're, we're also getting um, the third of three exact half squares between uh, between Jupiter and Neptune. Now, this half square between Jupiter and Neptune occurs in the evening. Um, the, um, the, the, the square between Venus and Uranus occurs in the morning on the third. Um, uh, let's move this, let, let's move the chart to the third so that we can see that. Here we are looking for at the chart of March 3rd. Um, the uh, Venus square Uranus occurs at 517 in the morning, so by noon it's already slightly, slightly past. Um, but the Jupiter half square to Neptune that occurs exactly at 6:57 p.m. These are slower moving aspects. These are th this energy has been with us since the beginning of March, maybe even the last few days of February. And it's important to understand that Jupiter because of its retrograde motion here has made this half square with Neptune three times. The first time was last summer, July 22nd. The second time on the retrograde was November 5th. And the third and final time now is on March 3rd. And this is about not seeing things the way they are. Now, remember, and I know that some of you have followed my work on the uh, non-zodiacal aspects like the half square and the square and a half. Um, half squares are not weak squares. In some ways, they're even stronger because they're more exacting, they're more pointed, they're, they're more motivational. And these half squares between Jupiter and Neptune are interesting because Jupiter and Neptune share an expansive energy in common. The difference is that Jupiter can only expand to the bounds of Saturn. Neptune can expand forever. And so we have Jupiter and Neptune, kind of Jupiter wanting to be logical, philosophical, having opinions and being able to justify them, but Neptune being absolute illusion, ideal, idealism, fantasy, dream, potential, possibility. And so where these two planets engage is really hard to figure out where, where our logical opinion 
becomes something that is totally illusory. And remember, illusions aren't bad. They're not even necessarily wrong. An illusion is something based upon a dream or a hope or a wish fulfillment. And that dream can become real. And in fact, as I've said many times before, it's Neptune's job to create those illusions, the dreams, that Saturn then enables us to build reality or structure upon. So Neptune is like our early, not early warning, but it's our, it's, it, it's our, it, it creates scaffolding. It, it creates, uh, Caroline Casey says that, that Neptune or imagination, she says, lays the tracks for the reality train to follow. I think that's a really good way of envisioning how Neptune and Saturn work together. And of course, it's not lost on me that as Neptune and Saturn both move into Aries um, in 2026, they will form a um, an exact conjunction. Um, and although that is a bit a ways, that, that exact conjunction um, will be um, the Neptune um, will will be actually in um, in February of 2026. So that's about a year and a half or two, about two years actually down down the road. <sighs> will the dreams become real, or what's real become the um, awakening that we realize that it was not ever real? It works both ways. Anyhow, back on March third, um, we have the this this um, uh, Jupiter making that half square with Neptune, and I think we have to really take everything with a grain of salt. I think we and salt, by the way, is a Saturn energy because Saturn constricts and contracts and crystallizes, and that's what salt does. Salt dries out; it crystallizes. When you think of the salt of the earth and that whole idea, it's you know it it, it it's a contract. It's it's a constriction and a crystallization. And, um, and, and, and Saturn, um, having just been lined up with or illuminated by the sun and rationalized uh, and intellectualized by Mercury, we're now seeing the other side of it. And as we open up to the potential and the possibility, we just have to be aware where reality and dreams intersect because it's that fuzzy area that is outside of the bounds of Saturn what you see is what you get, and not yet into the realms of total schizophrenic, paranoid fantasy. Somewhere in between is where we make that which is dream real. And so we have real potential in these opening days of March of of doing that as long as we don't get lost in some sense of illusions that, that we think that what we're imagining is to be truth. We have some reckoning yet to occur. Some of that reckoning may even occur as early as March 4th. And on March 4th, we have Mercury, actually midday, right around noon, um, makes a sextile with Uranus at, um, at 19 degrees of Taurus. Actually, we're looking here on, on the 4th. Um, early in the day, but that sextile, uh, because Mercury is moving very fast now, Mercury reaches 19 degrees and 41, actually 42 minutes, where that where that um, uh, sextile is exact, and that occurs um, on the fourth. And what does that mean? It means our logic, our thinking. Remember, Mercury in Pisces, kind of like Saturn in Pisces. Mercury likes logic. You know, remember Mercury is at home in 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 um, Virgo, and so in Pisces, it's as far away from its home as it can get. It's exiled. It's in its detriment. But not only that, Mercury is considered also to be exalted in in Virgo, and so it's also in its fall in Pisces. Mercury has a hard time in Pisces if it needs to be logical, if and and so and yet. There's a benefit still to Mercury existing in the realm of song, in the realm of poetry, in the realm of image, in the realm of imagination. But as that Mercury in Pisces makes a sextile with Uranus and Taurus, it's grounded. And remember, Taurus is the awakener. The lightning strikes, we get, we see the truth, we see things, and we go, 
I got it. Aha. And that can certainly occur um, on, on, on the 4th, on Monday the, the, the 4th. As we move on through the day, however, it's important also to note that the moon um, actually changes signs and moves um, out of Sagittarius midday, um, actually at 1.15, and it moves into um, it moves into Capricorn at 1.15 p.m., on the 4th, and again, things become more real, so to speak, as the moon in Capricorn is the home of Saturn, and so we have a few days now where we kind of have to deal with the constriction again of the Saturnian energy, um, and as the moon moves through Capricorn on the 4th, um, later on the 4th, and even in, on the 5th, um, by the time we get to the 6th, midday, um, we have the moon still in Capricorn, although the moon does enter Aquarius at 4.38 p.m. on Wednesday the 6th. But the other thing that happens on the 6th is that the sun is now making a half square to Pluto. Remember, we had Mercury making a half square to Pluto on the 2nd, and I talked about how Pluto is one of the difficult players right now, especially as planets going back to the Mars, not only um, square to Pluto, but all the planets back in February conjoining Pluto, um, the um, Mercury and the Venus and Mars all conjoining one at a time, uh, Pluto through late January and February, even the Sun conjoining Pluto. Um, but but now we're getting this half square from the Sun uh, to Pluto about 45 days, about a month and a half after it made the conjunction. And this again is conflict. This is, this is dynamic motivation to try to make something right that's not okay. And so we're definitely seeing some power struggle here because Pluto is often the power that's under the surface that doesn't let up, that's holding on to something that is showing us that there's more weight behind whatever the power structure is. And remember, Pluto as the hidden, the underworld, the unconscious, power doesn't relinquish its power to righteousness just because something is morally correct or right. There's still the weight of that past karma that's built up its own level of intensity. And often the fury is quite great when the hidden power structures feel like they're being attacked or threatened. And so we may say, see some more of that occur occurring um, as we see on March 6th, uh, the sun making that half square to Pluto. But we do have some hope here also because by um, later in the afternoon on the 6th, we see Mars making a sextile to Chiron. And so we, um, so we have this sense of there's some healing potential. And remember, we're still in, in a time when when the, no, when the North Node and Chiron are traveling together, even though the North Node, the, the true North Node, is already past its conjunction with Chiron, uh, many people use the average or mean node, and so we have some slop room here, and regardless we're still within the conjunction between the nodal axis and Chiron. So Mars is, and is actually um, at that point of Thales of the nodal axis where it's making a sextile to the north node and a trine to the south node. Um, and this is significant. Remember, Venus did this the end of February and the first day of March as Venus made that um, sextile to Chiron. So we have some good stuff working in in our favor, even though these aren't necessarily easy times. As we move the chart ahead, um, we can see that um, through the 7th, um, the, the moon is moved into Aquarius. It lines up with Pluto. It may exacerbate those energies. Um, by midday on the 7th, the, the moon is already well into Aquarius, heading towards its conjunctions with Mars and Venus later in the day on the 7th and early on the 8th. Um, as we look at the 8th, we also see that the moon um, actually enters Pisces at 5.30 in the evening. It's, the moon's going to make its conjunctions with Venus and Mars late on the 7th and then early in the morning on, on the 8th. 
Um, but the moon moves into Pisces um, by 5.03 p.m. on Friday, uh, March 8th. But the other thing that happens here on the 8th is that Mercury catches up to Neptune. Now, one of the things that I want to point out, and I should have really pointed this out at, at the beginning, and that is that we're in this very unusual phase, not only of all the planets still moving direct, the first planet that turns retrograde will be Mercury, which turns retrograde not this month, uh, but but next month. Um, and um, Mercury becomes the first of the planets. It turns uh, retrograde on April 1st. So by the end of March, Mercury is already slowing down. It's in its shadow. But the other planets don't really begin turning retrograde until um, later, um, um, later, later in the year. We'll get to that in a, in a bit. But the other thing to note here is that all the planets are clustered together. We have no trines and we have no um, oppositions. We have no quincunxes. We have no sesquisquares throughout the month of March, unless we count the moon. But if we take the moon out of the picture and we just cycle through the month from March 1st all the way through the 30th, we can see that all the planets are clustered together in, in, in a wedge, in a, in a very tight um, area of the sky, from Aquarius to Pisces to Aries to Taurus. What that means is that as the moon moved into Aquarius, it will conjoin first Pluto, then Mars, then Venus, then Saturn, then the sun, the new moon, we'll get to that in a moment, then, um, then Neptune, then Mercury, then the nodal axis, Chiron, Jupiter, and, um, and, uh, and Uranus over the next, over the next week. Uh, and this is really a, a lot of lunar action as the moon is moving through this side of the zodiac. But the other thing that we can see here is that Mercury, which conjoined Saturn and the Sun back on February 28th, um, by the 29th it was past that point, and now by March 8th, Mercury, which is still in Pisces, has caught up with Neptune, and the Mercury-Neptune conjunction is on the morning of the um, uh, March 8th at 7.06 a.m. is the exact conjunction, um, and this is like doubling down on that whole thing of illusion, confusion, fantasy, what's real, um, uh, us believing something that someone tells us that maybe isn't true, maybe we're saying something that we think is true and someone else believes our delusion. There's this whole thing of misleading or being misled, but on the other side, there's also that ability to use our imagination to convince people of something that is more spiritual, a higher cause, something that goes beyond what seems to be what's going on. There's something going on beyond that, that if we can also hook on to that, we sometimes can use that energy to pull ourselves out beyond the constraints of what appears to be reality into the realms of potentiality or possibility. The other thing is, is that as Mercury lines up with Neptune, remember, Neptune was making that exact half square just a few days ago to Jupiter, or I should say Jupiter was making the half square to Neptune. But what that means now is that as Mercury moves through that same area, Mercury is also going to be making that half square to Jupiter. And again, we have this sense of overinflation, big thinking, big ideas. Something is possible that didn't seem to be possible before. And this can work in two ways. Because remember, if we're in a battle with someone over what's true, what seems to be possible to us now is even more possible. <laughs> but that same can be said for someone else, because they're also seeing their truth as possible. So we're seeing here a conflict of big ideas, and it's hard to know what's real. Now, one of the most important things that goes on this month also, because remember, there are all the planets are clustered together, and there are no 
um, sesqui squares, quincunxes, or oppositions, or even trines from outer planet to outer planet, or from planet to planet other than the moon. But what we have on the 9th by midday, we have Mars moving into that square to Uranus. Remember, Venus was squaring Uranus back on the third, and I said there is the attraction, Venus, to breaking through the possibilities of what is existing, Saturn. Now, as Mars squares Uranus, we get kind of what can be like the tower card in Tarot. The lightning is striking, the tower can be burning, um, shit's going down, um, because this is no longer about what we like or what we think we want or about what we're reaching toward or about finding some sweet Venusian you know, kind of potential out of all of this. Now Mars, the warrior planet, uh, you know, is in the picture, and there can be absolute engagement, there can be fireworks, and and again, this is not just when the moment is exact at 2.55 p.m. on Saturday, March 9th, but this is cooking for, you know, a day or two or three prior to this, but we also have the moon entering Pisces, at, remember, at 5.03 p.m. Um, on, the, on the 8th, and as such, by the ninth, that um, moon is actually joining up with Saturn. That occurs in the morning on on uh, Saturday the ninth, and so we have this Mars Uranus that's crazy, electric, lightning striking, uh, unpredictable, something potentially even violent. But remember, violence isn't always negative. Uh, in other words, how do I say this and be careful? It is it, sometimes. If you imagine um, Saturn being a wall, and and um, and and Uranus being the lightning that breaks down that wall, or a fist that comes and plows right through that wall and allows us to get the freedom that we've been trying to get to, but there's been the Saturnian boundary in the way, and so. What I'm trying to say is is that Mars Uranus, the tower, can seem violent and violence always or, or can seem negative, but there's sometimes potential for the positive of what the energy is that's being released or what it is that's holding us back that may be able to be broken through. And I think we're seeing some of that at this point in time, especially as that moon um, aligns with, with um, as the moon conjoins Saturn, and it moves closer and closer um, to the new moon, which is exact, um, depending upon where you are, either late night on March 9th or early morning um, on the 10th. Because um, by midday on Saturday, um, we can see that the moon has already passed its conjunction to Saturn, and the actual new moon itself occurs at 1 a.m. Pacific time. And this is tricky because the clocks get set ahead, spring ahead, fall behind. The clocks get sprung ahead one hour at 2 a.m., but (laughs) this occurs at 1 a.m. Pacific time, which means that the clocks are not yet yet jumped ahead. So it's at 1 a.m. standard time, uh, (laughs) which I know it's a little crazy making because it's so close to that transition. But we're looking at this, and this is still Pacific Pacific standard time, And this new moon is very, very potent. Um, It is occurring with the new moon kind of caught between Saturn and Neptune. In fact, it's not at the exact midpoint, but it's close enough that this is setting up the energy that I don't think will be fully realized until Neptune and Saturn both move into Aries, and that conjunction occurs in February of 2026, as I I think that was the right date, February of 2026, as I said earlier. Let me just check that date to make sure I'm not misleading anyone. Um, Uh, Yeah, yeah, it's February 20th of 2026 when that is exact. 
And, and, and you see, this new moon, because it's about halfway between, it's about nine degrees um, away from Saturn on one side, and it's about only about seven, um, uh, you know, it's about, it's about, um, so yeah, about seven degrees away from, from Neptune on the other side. But something else very significant here also occurs, and that is that we can see that um, Mercury not only um, has conjoined Neptune, that it was exact on the, on, on the morning of the 8th, but now Mercury is past its conjunction to Neptune, and Mercury at 8.02 p.m., um, uh, which is just a f- 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1. It's, it's just five hours. I had to count on my fingers. It's five hours uh, prior to the new moon, but at 8 p.m., um, the moon um, is not yet new. That occurs at 1 a.m. on the morning of the 10th, but at 8.02 p.m., Mercury leaves Pisces and enters Aries. Now, this is hugely significant because we're getting a flavor of something that's coming in yet down the road. It's not yet here, but all of a sudden our thinking becomes a lot more direct and our logic becomes more pointed. We're we're getting set up for this move of planets into Aries. The moon will move into Aries, um, um, later in the afternoon on the 10th um, at 5.19 uh, p.m. Um, and then we um, will have also Venus and Mars moving into Aries still a bit down the road. We'll go there. That, that, that won't occur for a bit yet. Um, but what's significant here is that this new moon is kind of like caught in the balance between make it real Saturn and don't be limited by what seems to be real. Make it m- make it potentially whatever you want to dream or imagine because both of those are true we're kind of caught caught in the middle if if you will um the other thing though about this um new moon is how close it is to the mars square uranus and that is the towers are burning something's something's going on the energy is being released and we're not able to contain it um the the fact that the um new moon occurs um very close to the sextile to uranus um because uh we have uranus at 1953 or actually it's almost 20 degrees of taurus we have mars now at the new moon at 20 degrees of aquarius and we have the new moon occurring at basically 20 degrees um, of pisces that's a half of a sextile a semi sextile to mars on one side and a sextile to uranus on the other basically feeding right into this crazy releasing energy that's going to break through something what it is that's going to break through and what and how it falls out you know we have yet to see but all of this is building and i would suggest a lot of this is building toward not only the full moon eclipse later this month but the new moon eclipse on April 8th that will be followed by the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction on April 20th. And you can see here already that even on this new moon, Jupiter and Uranus are already only seven degrees apart. They are already within range of being conjoined. This conjunction happens every 14 years. And it is, a, I think, a portal, an opening into the future. And we are approaching it. There's no question about it. But it's still murky. It's still mucky. It's still hard to tell where we are or what's going on for 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 real. All right, let's move on. Um, oh, and we also have um, here. I, I mentioned that um, that Mercury is moving into Aries, but the other thing that we have here also is that Venus, at the tail end of Aquarius, enters 
Aries, I'm sorry, enters Pisces. And it's almost just like it's, it's, it's as Mercury gets out of Pisces into Aries. Now we have Venus coming in from behind, moving into Pisces. And Venus moves into Pisces um, on the afternoon of March 11th. Um, and on March 11th, um, we also have the moon moving through Aries now. Um, remember, the moon actually moved into Aries um, just after 5 o'clock on um, on the 10th, um, and we'd already talked about that. But what's happening now is that on the 12th, by midday on the 12th, we can see that the moon is already toward the latter end of, of, of Aries. In fact, the moon will move into Taurus about 5.30 um, on the 12th, 5.30 p.m., uh, Tuesday afternoon, actually 5.28 is the exact clock time. Um, but the other thing here is that's going on now is that we're also getting Mercury making a half square with Uranus. Remember, before Mercury was making um, a, a half square with Jupiter, but because Jupiter and Uranus are getting closer and closer together, as a planet lines up or makes an aspect with Jupiter, it'll also then make an aspect with, um, with, with, with Uranus. And actually, in a couple of days, we'll see the moon moving through Taurus, and it will conjoin Jupiter and then conjoin Uranus. And the energy now is we're getting getting the sense of the potential of Jupiter, of the opportunities, of the hope. That's Jupiter. And then Uranus, the kick, something actually happens and allows us to either realize it or break through or have those hopes or illusions shattered because when the lightning strikes, we get to see it one way or another. So on March 12th, um, midday, we have Mercury making a um, a half square with Uranus. And again, this is intellectual breakthrough, awakening, something something going on. We learn something, we say something um, that we couldn't say before. Um, by the 13th, um, we have more half square energies. Incidentally, because all the planets are clustered so close together, it's interesting to me that this entire month we have such a predominance of half squares. I mean, we had back on the second, we had Mercury making a half square with Pluto, then Jupiter making a half square with Neptune on the third, then the Sun making a half square with Pluto on the sixth. Mercury making a half square with Jupiter on the 8th, then Mercury making a half square with Uranus on the 12th, which is where we are now. Then we come up to the 13th, where we have Venus making a half square with Chiron. On the 14th, Mercury makes a half square now with Mars on the other side, back in Aquarius. We'll get there in a moment. Then the Sun makes a half square with Jupiter on the 19th. Venus makes a half square with, um, with Pluto on the 25th. The Sun makes a half square with Uranus on the 25th also, and then Mars makes a half square with Chiron on the 27th. I know that was a whole string of dates, but if you make note of these, these are all important dates because something can happen. We're driven to a point where, where if we take action, we can, we can cut through something, we can break loose, we can make something happen. We just need to be careful that we don't overreact impulsively and make something happen that we wish we didn't. This doesn't mean that we should just take action always, but it means that if we got something right that we've been waiting to do, these are times in which we can actually have real impact from what our actions are. All right, coming back to the 13th, the Venus half square to Chiron. You know, this isn't easy because it's like what we would like to happen, Venus might run into something that reminds us of what doesn't work, of what doesn't feel good, of where someone gets in our way or where something hurt in the past or some lesson that we need to learn. Um, and then on the 14th, when Mars, um, uh, on the 14th, when Mercury makes that half square to Mars, it's like now what we say, Mercury, Mercury and Aries, we're saying things maybe more flippantly, maybe more 
um, impulsively with Mercury and Aries. We're saying what's on our mind rather than just kind of holding on to the to the thought. And with Mercury making that half square to Mars, Mars being the dispositor um, of Mercury because Mars is at home in Aries, Mercury in Aries, we could say things that stir up someone. In other words, we could say something and someone could say something and flatten us or some, someone could, we could say something and someone could hit us. And again, I don't necessarily mean physical, but, but it can be that because it's Mars. And so we have to be careful or a bit diplomatic about how we say what we need to say. We can be very impactful, but we can be more impactful if we think about it in a way that is um, logical or reason or so- reason reason through or solid. And, and remember a couple days ago, I also mentioned that the moon would be moving through Taurus and it would conjoin with Jupiter and then Uranus. Well, the moon actually conjoins with Jupiter um, on the 13th, uh, that would be on on Wednesday. Um, uh, it, the moon conjoins with Jupiter at about 4.12 p.m., and then it conjoins with Uranus at about 3 in the morning uh, uh, on Thursday, on the 14th. Uh, and then the moon moves into, into Gemini later in the day, actually in the evening on the 14th. We'll get there in a moment. But with the moon moving through Taurus, we can make use of our feet on the ground, and yet as it aligns with Jupiter, we may see the opening, the potential, the hope. Um, And then as it aligns or conjoins with Uranus, um, something breaks through again. So this is, I think, a very potent couple of days um, as, um, as these events unfold and as Venus moves into Pisces, makes the half square with Chiron, and uh, Mercury makes the half square with, with Mars. Then as we move ahead, the moon, as I said earlier, um, the moon moves into, in, into Gemini, um, and the moon actually um, enters Gemini in the evening on, um, on, on uh, Thursday the 14th at 8.15 p.m., um, and uh, as we continue that move through the moon moving through Gemini, it's going to square the planets in Pisces um, over Friday and Saturday into early Sunday even. Um, the moon will move into Cancer um, early in the morning on, on the 17th, um, uh, that being on Sunday. But in between that, the moon will square Venus and Saturn and the sun and Neptune. But the other thing that happens is that as we move through the weekend with the moon moving through Gemini, which may activate and encourage our thinking, and we may get a lot done this weekend, we may waste a lot of energy being distracted and doing a lot of different things. Um, But by the 17th, um, the sun actually catches up with Neptune. We can see here that on Saturday the 16th, um, we have the sun just one day away, one degree away from Neptune. We can also note, though, that Venus is moving closer to Saturn. Remember, we had the Sun and Mercury conjuncting Saturn back at the end of February, and uh, and the Sun has moved away from that, moving toward Aries. Mercury has already moved into Aries, but now we have behind that, we have Venus coming into a conjunction with Saturn that we will talk about more in um, a moment, because that is um, that that is quite an important event that occurs on the 21st, um, just after the the sun moves into Aries. Um, We'll come back to that in a minute. Meanwhile here, what we have on the 17th is that as I move this ahead to noon on the 17th, we can see now that the sun has just jumped from one side of um, Neptune to the other. The sun is now um, uh, at a higher degree than Neptune. That actual conjunction occurs um, at 4.22 a.m. So we're feeling this over the entire weekend, Saturday um, and Saturday night, Saturday evening, certainly Sunday. We wake up Sunday morning. The sun is still very, very close to Neptune. This is 
illuminating the dream, the fantasy, the spirituality. We may get lost in illusions or fantasies, or this can be very yummy, and then we wake up, and then a few days later, as Venus kind of catches up to Saturn, our illusions become dis illusioned because that's what Saturn's job is to uh, that's what Saturn's job is to to do our Saturn creates the illusions and makes them real it's disillusionment but disillusionment isn't a bad thing because when we become disillusioned that's making the dreams real which sometimes aren't as awesome most of the times they're not as awesome as they were when they were in our imagination but that's the process of neptune and saturn that we're going to be talking about for the next couple of years as saturn uh, slowly moving through pisces gets closer and closer to neptune and that exact alignment doesn't occur until february of 20 um, 2026 but meanwhile we're getting that little microcosmic fractal reverberation of um, the sun lining up and brightening illuminating our dreams our neptune our illusions of course in pisces everything is illusory even the crystallization and the reality check of Saturn is still a bit fuzzy. You know, we look in the mirror um, or through the lens and see the reality. It's like we look at those lenses, our glasses, to sharpen what's out there, and we forget that those lenses are also distorting things. So, this period of the of, of the this weekend as the sun lines up with neptune in some ways is the expansive dreamy side again but by the 21st and we're getting day by day closer to the reality of oh my god this isn't as good as i thought it was because that that conjunction of um of uh of of venus with saturn is going to force us to to make it real to bring it back down to the realm of the senses that's the 17th by the way we can also see here that mercury is moving closer and closer to uh chiron um mercury actually catches up with chiron on the 20th just after the vernal equinox but what that means also is that Mercury is going to catch up to the North Node or the nodal axis. That's exact on the afternoon of the 18th. And, um, and Mercury is still moving pretty fast right now, although it's going to begin slowing down um, as it reaches its maximum um, um, uh, declination or its, its maximum uh, degree separation um, from the sun, and then it will begin to turn retrograde on April 1st. But right now, Mercury is still whizzing along, and it actually catches up with the node, with the north node on the af late afternoon of the 18th, um, and then catches up with Chiron on the morning of the 20th. And so what we're seeing here um, is the ability to use our intellect to address um, those things which we've learned, those things which have been difficult or painful in the past that we might now teach ourselves or learn from um, lessons, uh, even if they're not fun lessons from other people. This is a chance to use language to, to forgive those who have hurt us um, or even to forgive ourselves for that part of our own actions that maybe have hurt others. This is all important, important part of that process. Um, and, um, and the moon here now moving through Cancer is making trines with those planets in Pisces. And at the same time, we're inching closer and closer closer um, to the vernal equinox. Um, as we approach the vernal equinox, um, incidentally, um, the, the um, moon will slip into Leo, a fire sign, just before the sun slips into Aries, the fire sign, which is the moment of the vernal equinox. And if we look at the chart here on Tuesday, the 19th, look at that sun hanging back at that very last 29 degrees um, and 42 minutes. It's a quarter of a degree away from its movement into Aries and that first moment of spring, which actually um, occurs that first moment of spring 
um, occurs um, at 8.06 p.m., and that is the vernal equinox with the sun at zero degrees of Aries, and yet we get that sun-moon trine just prior to that happening as the moon is still hanging back in in um, in, in Cancer, making the tr- exact trine to the sun just before it moves into Aries. And again, we're getting this dance between the dreamy, the Piscean, because remember that moon hanging back um, in, in, in Pisces, uh, I'm sorry, the moon hanging back in Cancer, trining the sun in Pisces, is also just trying Neptune in Pisces, magnifying, magnifying the dream. But at the first moment of that vernal equinox, by the evening of March 19th, Wednesday evening, as the sun moves into Aries, the energy really begins to shift. Now, also note that Venus is getting closer and closer to its conjunction with Saturn. We, we, we can't avoid the fact that we're not going to get what we want. doesn't matter what we want. There's a reality check going on that's going to make us wonder if it wasn't better for us to just forget about it. Why bother? We're going to be disappointed. We're going to be disillusioned. But that process of reaching too far and then not getting everything is an important process because when Venus reaches its conjunction with Saturn, even though we don't get everything that we want, if we're realistic, the things that we get are things that are real, important, and lasting, and will endure. So, on the um, 20th, we have the exact Mercury conjunction with with Chiron. That's at 1026 a.m. And again, our words can have um, healing. They can be hurtful if we're unconscious. Remember, conjunctions can be unconscious. But we have Chiron and Mercury and the North Node all clustered fairly close together. This is important. And by the 21st, as the Sun is moving now into um, further on into Aries, remember Pluto at still one degree, not quite two degrees of, um, of Aquarius. As the sun reaches one degree of Aries um, by j- one o'clock, one one o- one p.m., uh, actually uh, one o two p.m. exact, um, the sun will make a sextile with Pluto, and this theoretically could be something that's constructive, an opportunity with that energy that has been very difficult as planets have made hard energy aspects, um, uh, the half squares and the um, squares and the conjunctions to Pluto. Now, as the sun is making a sextile to Pluto, we have the potential for doing something that can be real and can really touch the depths. And on top of that, if we're willing to to sacrifice what might sound like it feels good, we can in fact make use of that Venus moving into its conjunction um, with 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 Saturn. That's not exact until the twenty first at four p.m. four o nine p.m. We can see here at noon on the twenty first how close that Venus Saturn conjunction is, and the Sun. Um, uh, uh, exactly partile, but I mean, to the minute, actually, midday, um, the sun sextile to Pluto, a very powerful day, March 21st. Um, This is a day of the energy grounding and of us being able to make real breakthrough that solidifies things. It's not just busting through the wall. It's now, how are we going to construct something on the other side of that wall? And in fact, we we also can see that Mars, which is just getting ready to change signs, moving out of Aquarius and into Pisces, um, is also important because Mars is getting closer and closer to the half of a sextile, the semi-sextile, or to Pluto on one side, the Sun on the other side, meaning that Mars is right at that midpoint, that middle point, 
the halfway point between the sun um, and Pluto kind of emphasizing that energy even more. This is a very strong, very powerful day. And as Mars moves into Pisces um, on, um, on, on the 22nd, um, that would be Friday the 22nd um, at 4.47 p.m., so it's late afternoon, um, that that w- what happens here is is important because Mars is not comfortable <laughs> in Pisces because it, it it can be very intuitive. It can be very powerful as a spiritual warrior, but it's not very good as a physical warrior because. Pisces is metaphysical. Pisces is is soul, is compassion, is is spirit, is um, is our dreams, is our um, is, is the psychic energy. And Mars in Pisces means that we can be doing combat for what is morally and ethically and spiritually useful and valuable. But on the physical plane, it might be a bit lost. And so we're, we're kind of coming out of the sharper energy of Mars um, um, moving through Aquarius. Um, and, and what's interesting here is that as Mars moves um, from, um, uh, from Aquarius to Pisces, it's going to, and it moved into Aquarius back in mid-February. So Mars actually has moved um, from mid-February to mid-March, and then another couple, another week or so, um, has moved through an entire sign. But here's the thing, and that is that Mars, as it moves through Pisces, is going to catch up with Saturn just like the Sun and Mercury did back at the end of February, and just like Venus did just a couple of days ago, Mars is going to catch up with Saturn in Pisces, um, in effect, just like um, the other planets did, and it's going to do that on April 9th, just within a day of the solar eclipse, of the total eclipse on April 8th. This is very important because Mars's entry um, into Pisces is really setting up that energy of Mars lining up with Saturn on April 9th. And then by April 28th, Mars will reach Toward the end of Pisces, Mars will line up with Neptune. Again, all these same planets, um, the Sun and Mercury and Venus, all lined up with Saturn, then they lined up with Neptune. Venus hasn't reached Neptune yet, but, but, um, but, but it will. Um, and that, that Venus um, to Neptune um, is certainly <laughs> important because each of the planets first get get made real they get they get constricted they get crystallized reality becomes real in a sign that's not very real not very crystallized and so mars's entry into pisces is very important in this larger sweep of energy we may not know where we're going but if we have an intuitive sense that we're going in the right direction if we stick to our higher sense of values remember venus in in pisces is where it's exalted venus loves being in pisces because it is about as it moves towards its higher ideals, that, that connection with Neptune, that's where the magic can occur. So we're being set up for some very important things here um, as we move through the month of, of, of March and as we move closer and closer um, to the uh, full moon. But before we get to the full moon, on the 24th, we have Venus um, making a um, a uh, sextile with Jupiter. Now we also have um, uh, uh, the Moon. The, the uh, I think we've lost track of the Moon here a little bit. The Moon having moved through Leo. Um, the Moon entered Leo as I mentioned just before the vernal equinox on the nineteenth, um, and then the equinox um, right right after that, um, and then um, the Moon moving through. Uh, Leo opposed um, Pluto in Aquarius, 
um, and then it opposed, um, and and then um, it opposed Mars. Um, and interestingly enough, um, the moon moving through Leo opposed Mars at that very, very, very last degree of Leo when the Mars at the last degree of Aquarius, again, part of this whole shift of energy. And, um, and the moon actually moved into Virgo at 1241 a.m. on the 22nd. That w- would be Friday, the 22nd. And then the moon um, opposed um, or opposes, um, if we do this in real time, um, the Venus-Saturn conjunction, which is kind of giving us that whole sense of the differentiation between the dream. Now, the conjunction is a little bit after the fact here already, but but that moon moving through Virgo is, is encouraging us to focus our energy. And we're moving toward um, the... Um, full moon eclipse that will be the the Libra full moon, um, and this is very very potent because here on the twenty um, third and on the actually let's move forward to the twenty fourth, um, we can see that now Venus. Um, in the morning at about 9.30, not about, at 9.36 a.m., Venus perfects its sextile to Jupiter. And this is Venus exalted in Pisces, making a opportunistic cooperative sextile with Jupiter in Taurus that's not going to take any opportunity that comes down the road. It's going to take the right opportunity. But this is a good news transit. And, and as long as we don't abuse it or don't take it too far or don't become too extravagant with it. But remember, we still have that Uranus pushing toward that conjunction. I'm sorry, we have Jupiter pushing toward that conjunction with Uranus. That's not exact until next month, about a month down the road, April 20th. But all of this is building, all this energy is building. And on the night of the 24th, um, or or at the first moment <laughs> that actually the, the actually technically the exact first moment of Monday the 25th at 12 midnight or zero um, zero degree not zero degrees zero hours um, into Monday the 25th not at 12:01 a.m on Monday, the 25th Pacific time, but at 12 o'clock midnight at the, at the witching hour at midnight, the moon is full and it is, um, the, the, the exact, um, moment, um, occurs at five degrees of Aries and seven minutes, um, is where the exact um, uh, uh, conjunction, I'm sorry, opposition is. And this is the first of two eclipses this season. Now, I'm not going to delve too far into eclipses. Everybody's talking about the eclipses. They're important. Eclipses are important because they, they're a break in the energy. They're, they're kind of like a, another portal or a vortex. They somehow slip through the space-time uh, crack and they, they, they kind of transmit energy energy from one direction to another. They are significant. But what's really important here is that this is the first of two eclipses, the second one being the new moon eclipse and the building of this energy up to the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction that occurs just a couple of weeks after the next eclipse, which occurs a couple of weeks after um, the this 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 eclipse. Um, so this eclipse, which is an eclipse of relationship, it's an eclipse of 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 justice, of balance, of of inner to outer. The full moon is in Libra. Um, but the other thing that is significant here is that we have Venus um, within just a couple of hours of the eclipse. Venus, which is just coming away from its conjunction to Saturn, is now making a half square to Pluto. And, um, and the eclipse itself um, is making a half square to Uranus. So we're getting these half squares again that I mentioned earlier 
on the 25th, even on the 27th, um, as Mars comes in and makes a half square to Chiron. And this is uncomfortable. It's motivating. It, 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 it's like um, I, there's an energy here. I'm making this motion with my hand. I don't know how to describe it. It's like, it's like a niggling. It's like a, no, it's stronger than that. It's like, it's like someone putting salt on the wound. It's someone scratching. Uh, it's not like salt on the wound. It's like iodine on an open wound. Something is not right. And, and we're being driven or motivated to do something about it. And this is all tied up with the eclipse energy. And with the Venus um, half square to Pluto, this may not be nice. It may not be good to the power structure or to the financial uh, economic Venus power structure. With the sun half square Uranus, it's like the lightning is striking and we're breaking through something. With the Mars half square Chiron, that's not exact until the 27th. Let's actually move this ahead um, the moon continues to move through Libra. It will um, go over the nodal axis and then uh, oppose Chiron and, um, and, and Mercury. And by um, the, the 26th, um, we can see that the um, moon on the midday of the 26th is at 23 degrees of, of Libra. Um, I mean, it's just all strong energy. All these planets are so clustered, so close together. If we look at Mars, Saturn, Venus, Neptune, the Sun, the North Node, Chiron, and Mercury, they're all within 60 degrees of one another. They're all within, um, you know, within Pisces, Aries. They're all within those two signs. It's, it's pretty, pretty intense. Um, even going out to the Jupiter and Uranus and Taurus, it's still sextile by signs. Um, you know, so it's a little bit wider than a sextile by degree, but this is just a focused, focused energy um, with the uh, moon and Libra kind of being a reflective point. It's, it's the handle of the bucket all through this period of time. It's the only thing that's moving outside of this self-contained energy, and that's what makes this uh, eclipse or eclipse season uh, so important, this eclipse in Libra. We're really getting the, the, the whack the whammy, the, the reality check from what's out there to what we think is in here. There's this flip-flop of relationship occurring um, that, I, that I think is, is very important. And the moon in um, Libra actually um, um, enters Scorp... Well, it, it opposes the Chiron and Mercury um, on the 26th. Um, uh, it, it finishes up with Mercury by 4 o'clock in the afternoon, 4.08 p.m. It, then it moves into Scorpio at uh, 2.02 a.m., just the very early um, wee hours of the morning on Wednesday, the 27th. The moon enters Scorpio, and once the moon enters Scorpio, it's going to square Pluto, <laughs> and then it will fairly quickly, um, um, over the 28th and 29th, that is over the 28th, it'll oppose Jupiter and Uranus as it's moving through Scorpio. Um, and here on the 27th, we also have the Mars making that exact half square to Chiron. This is not a feel-good aspect, but it does motivate us. We just have to make sure we don't overreact. Because remember, Mars, Mars being half square to um, Chiron, um, Mars is dispositing Chiron. Um, if we're acting out of fear or out of hurt or out of anger, Mars, um, we can overstep our bounds. We can do more damage than good. Um, but we culminate the month with Venus moving into that sextile with Uranus. I talked about that being that earlier because all those planets that are first um, making a sextile to Jupiter um, as um, Venus did back on March 24th, then moved to the sextile to Uranus. And this again is the attraction to what's happening, to the excitement of breaking through. And we still have a bit to go before Venus catches up to um, Neptune. Um, that, that does occur um, uh, that does occur um, next month, um, meaning in, in April, um, the Venus will conjoin 
with Neptune, I think, around the 3rd. Then that'll bring us into the eclipse season around uh, my birthday on April 6th and the uh, total eclipse on April 8th. But all I can say is that, you know, is that this is just another month where there's so much going on. Um, I know we went a bit longer than we normally go, but I really wanted to drill down on the daily energy of what's happening um, because things are moving. Things are moving fast. And as we look ahead to the month, again, kind of like February, kind of like March, um, or, or kind of like February, March is one of those months that I don't think there's any way to really tell where we'll be or what will be going on by the time we reach the end of the month. Just like there were twists and turns in the month of February that brought us to places by the end of the month that maybe changed what we thought was real or what we thought was going on back at the beginning of the month. Everything is in play. Uh, things are really moving and they're moving quickly. And I can just say a couple of words of advice that I would give to myself, whether they apply to you or not is your decision. But as we think cosmically and try to act locally, it's important to keep this balance between the inner planets and the outer planets. Between, between the reality of, and the crystallization and what appears to be real of Saturn and the potential and the opportunities of, of um, Jupiter and the breaking through those walls of Saturn, Uranus, and also the dreams of Neptune. Where do all these things combine? How does what's holding on to the depth of the power structure, Pluto, how is that holding us back and how do we need to work slowly to chip away at these deeper karmic things that are not going to change overnight and yet have to in order for us to survive, in order for us to, you know, to get through this. Remember, everyone's at a different point in this, you know, in this spectrum. You know, some people can look at what's going to be happening over the weeks, months, and years ahead and work on that level. For other people, who are starving or who have no food or water or who have had their parents massacred while they tried to get food for, for them. Um, everyone's at a different point in this spectrum. And for some people, you got to take care of what's going on in your life the best you can right now, today tomorrow. Uh, uh, and for other people, we have the luxury of thinking of what's going to go on next week or next month. And we have to always not confuse the longer term goals for what's happening in the moment, knowing that we need to do what we need to do to survive. Ego is important because ego keeps us in the game. At the same time, we also have to be aware of where ego doesn't serve us and where we need to step beyond our individual or our, our self-serving um, boundaries that we think that we need to maintain because we're afraid of what might happen if we step beyond them to begin to take care of those people we love or those people around us or the wider issues of humanity or of social existence out there. These are tricky times. I don't have a quick and easy answer for anyone. I don't have a quick and easy answer for myself. All I can do is, is remind myself and remind all of you to think cosmically and yet as we act locally, don't overreact, but don't underreact. There are things that we can do in our daily lives, in our hourly lives, in how we respond to someone, how we open the door to be kind to someone, how we donate some money to some cause that's doing good for someone, even though we might not get anything out of it on a personal level. What can we do that can increase um, the, 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 the positive side of someone's life. How can we express our compassion? How can we connect to humans around us or those who seem incredibly far away and at the same time not lose sight of the fact that we have to keep it going hour to hour, day to day, week to week, and month to month in order to realize the fruition of what may be around this incredibly potent and powerful change that we, as humans on planet Earth, are going through during these decades. 
That's it. I'm Rick Levine. Peace out. I'll see you all down the road. Thank you.